everything is going to hell down here in Texas. And now, here's your host, Rob Clark. What the hell is up, dudes and dudettes? It is your boy, Rob Clark. This is the Lone Gummit Podcast, and this is the last night of the year of our Lord, 2022. And I bid you all a happy New Year's Eve, a safe night, and nothing but the best in the year to come. 2023. All right. Here is the deal. First of all, I would like to thank my new friend Randy for some of this wonderful music that you're going to hear on the show and the intros and the outros. It's phenomenal. I'm so glad he reached out to me. Uh, he's a listener and he's also a damn fine musician this band shepherd on fire uh supplying some of the hot new stuff here and he is a left-handed metal guitar player much like my buddy doug so he must be a stand-up dude because i don't know any left-handed metal guitar players who are dicks so once again thank you randy i appreciate it it sounds great suits the show just fine and uh couldn't be happier. Hope you, hopefully you like my mix-up, mash-up mix there in the beginning. Um, Alright, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects having to do with the Kennedy assassination, and that's Jack Ruby. Alright? Because I feel like we don't know enough about Jack Ruby. I get questions all the time. You know, why did Jack Ruby do what he did? Who put him up to it? What the hell was he up to? Why did he say the things that he said? In order to answer those questions, we need to know who Jack Ruby was. And we can kind of figure that out based on information from the people that knew him the best, who were around him the most, the longest. And all that good stuff. All right, so <laughs> let's get right into it. Because I, I got some interesting documents here, not from the newest document release, but some that you may have not heard from before. And one where I am going to have to get into a very Dago esque like character just for you. Because I know you love it when I do voices on this show. So stay tuned for that. It is coming, I swear. I promise you. And you're going to love it. All right. So the first document I have here is an FBI report from December the 13th of 1963. And it concerns Sam Campisi, co-owner of the Egyptian restaurant on Monkey Bird, Bird Lane in Dallas, Texas, and uh, says he's known Jack Ruby for 10 years. He said he is acquainted with Ruby through seeing him at various sporting events, through visiting his clubs, and through Ruby eating at his restaurant. He said the last time he saw Ruby was the Thursday before Thanksgiving, or the assassination, on which date Ruby had dinner at the Egyptian restaurant the night before the assassination. Campisi said he always considered Ruby to be a very impulsive individual. He said Ruby did not stand for any disorderliness in his club, 
It on more than one occasion has witnessed Ruby put individuals of his club onto their asses for being boisterous or loud. Campisi said he always considered Ruby to be a publicity seeker and an individual who would go to any extremes to gain the same. He said he feels, in connection with Ruby's shooting of Oswald, that Ruby thought he would be stopped by someone in the basement of the police department before he actually got close enough to Oswald to shoot him. He said that he felt that Ruby hoped to gain fame for himself and his clubs through perhaps perpetrating an attack which would have been stopped before he could carry it out. Campisi said he has always liked Ruby personally, but considers him to be crazy. Campisi advised he is not acquainted with any of Ruby's associates or acquaintances. He said he does not know if Ruby was acquainted with Oswald. Campisi further advised that he sent a Christmas card, oh, isn't that sweet, to Jack Ruby at the Dallas County Jail within the past several days. You know, because that's what we do to our friends who just shot the assassin of the president. We give them a Christmas card. All right, so this guy has known Ruby for 10 years. Mafia connected, uh, or syndicate connected, shall we say. Um, so, uh, take that for what you will. We all know how the FBI felt about the mafia. They didn't even mention that word. I did not like to acknowledge their existence. Um, this is a good one. All right, next up, we have a document. We have a document here from the FBI. Uh, same date, actually, December 13th, 1963. Maddie Nelson of Forest Avenue was interviewed with reference to information from Hal Collins from La Jolla, California, to the effect that in early 1950, Jack Ruby had tried to adopt a child. What? Yeah, you heard me. He tried to adopt a child. She was interviewed in the presence of her husband, Columbus Nelson, she, oh, Columbus Nelson, she, uh, she, she related the following. This is not my, uh, act for you yet either. I just love these Southern names. Mr. Columbus Nelson, her son, Ben Estes Nelson, had a stage name, Little Daddy. Nelson was born on September 28th, 1947. In Franklin, Texas. When he was about two and a half or three years old, Mr. and Mrs. Nelson discovered that little daddy had learned to dance and do jigs and was very talented. He also learned to keep time with sticks and spoons, etc. And when he was about five years old, he appeared on some amateur programs, which he could not remember, and came to the attention of Jack Ruby who was then operating the Silver Spur nightclub in Dallas. Little Daddy was then put under contract by Jack Ruby and appeared in nightclubs in Dallas, including the Silver Spur, the Vegas Club, and Bob Willis's Ranch House. This would have been in about 51 or 52. Jack Ruby was so impressed with Little Daddy that he took him to Chicago his parents accompanying Little Daddy, and Jack Ruby got him dates in some nightclubs in the Chicago area, and Little Daddy appeared on one television program in Chicago. This was about 1953 or 54. Ruby had the child on a contract and acted as his manager and got a percentage of his earnings during the time that the child was performing. Little Daddy last entertained for Jack Ruby about eight or nine years ago, which would have been in 54 or 55. They have had no contact with Ruby for eight or nine years, except on one occasion in November of 62, when Jack Ruby telephoned them out of the blue and asked them if they needed anything, and stated that if they ever did need anything, to just let him know. 
Mrs. Nelson was unacquainted with Lee Harvey Oswald by name or photograph as being anyone known to her as being a friend or associate of Jack Ruby. She knew of no organizations to which Jack Ruby belonged and stated that all the while they had known him, they believed him to be a loyal, upstanding citizen. Mrs. Nelson said that on several occasions, Jack Ruby expressed his desire to adopt the family from them. Because, you know, he doesn't want to adopt a child away from their parents to exploit them and make money off of them and probably uh, diddle them. I mean, hey, it's the 1950s, folks. I'm joking, of course. But uh, that's some creepy shit. Creep, creep. Three. Moving right along to our doozy document, who you will love. We have this memorandum to Jim Alcock, who was a assistant district attorney under Jim Garrison, May 15th, 1968, from Bill Turner. Subject, Howard Rice Knight, a former acquaintance of Jack Ruby. Enclosed as a statement prepared by Mr. Knight, he lived in Dallas in 1960 and 61 with his wife and children. He admits, although he admits, though, to being bisexual, he spent time in the Texas penitentiary for bad checks passed. He says to support his family. He is currently a playwright in the Bay Area. My own impression is that he is not given to fantasy and did indeed know Ruby and Eva Grant. He does have an ego problem and is quite discursive in conversation. I tried to get additional facts from him, but the statement seems to be the extent of his knowledge or recollection. At Criswell, he mentions as pastor of the largest Baptist church in the country, and it is in Dallas. Criswell made sharp anti-Kennedy statements during the 1960 campaign, Excuse me, including the allegation that Kennedy would make the U.S. a satrapy of Rome, whatever that means. On page two, Knight alludes to several people Ruby reportedly said would give considerable sums to have Kennedy disposed of. In addition to Hunt, uh, that would be H.L. Hunt and Criswell, he faintly recalls the names Earl Cabell, his brother, as high in the CIA, a former mayor of Dallas and owner of Cabell's Milk, a Bruce Alger, a former congressman from Dallas, and a hunt man, uh, and Eric Johnson, head of Texas Instruments and currently mayor of Dallas. In 1968 now, remember. These names are vague in his memory. However, he is not certain Ruby mentioned them in the above context. There does not seem to be any lead material in Knight's statement and no further actions contemplated here. But, folks, you've got to hear this statement in the hopefully appropriate voice of Howard Rice Knight. We met Jack Ruby in Dallas in September, October 1960. This is the coming election of Kennedy began to get in full swing. Ruby and his sister were living together in an expensive apartment on Mission Street, just off of North Fitzhugh. Ruby had two toy chihuahua dogs, which he referred to as his children. He was very devoted to his animals. He was most impressed with my little family. He grew to like me and confided many things to me. His sister, Eva Grant, was going to a doctor who I routinely called on in my work as a drug representative from Myers Carter Laboratories of Phoenix, Arizona. The doctor's name was Ivan Estes, no relation to Billy Saul, of Edgewood, Texas, seven miles east of Willis Point, approximately 48 miles east of Dallas. Eva Grant was hooked on the needle. Now, damn, she was hooked on the needle. 
brought about by frequent injections of a female hormone containing 10 milligrams of dextroamphetamine per cc. This drug was called Amgan. This same doctor got me hooked on a companion drug called Malglan. Painted male hormones as well as the amphetamine. Dr. Estes usually gave two cc's per injection. He charged Miss Grant ten dollars per injection. He did not charge me anything since my company carried this drug in its line. Actually, it was the doctor's only source, so that was very important to him. Additionally, the good doctor gave every patient he saw either one or two cc's of this drug along with the vitamin B12 shot. As the doctor once told me, I give everybody a shot of this stuff since it makes them feel so good. They always come back for more. He had many people hooked as well as himself. He also took daily injections of Demerol and Dilaudid. Ain't nothing wrong with that, folks. He was, at that time, past 70 years old, about 6 foot 2, and weighed in the neighborhood of 160 pounds. Considerably underweight, due no doubt, to massive doses of these drugs. Now, Ruby himself, though not on this particular form of amphetamines, was on Dexedrine and had been for some time before I met him. He had a weight problem, had it all his life. In conversations with Jack alone, he told me of several people in Dallas at that time who would give a considerable sum, contributions, to do away with Mr. Kennedy could he win the election. Yes, he named names such as H.L. Hunt, W.A. Criswell, and many others. He said he would consider being a part of such a plan if he didn't have to be the trigger man himself, as he personally, personally liked Kennedy and was in love with his wife and children and would do nothing ever to hurt them, especially killing the president. However, he said if he were personally approached by some of these people and for enough money, he would be in on such plans and would become a part in it. Though Ruby was far from wealthy, he did have two nightclubs going, the Carousel in downtown Dallas, which was a private club owned by the most part by paying memberships among some very important people in Dallas who thought like Ruby, and the Vegas Club down on Oak Lawn. Eva ran this club herself and had a considerable amount of her own money invested in it as well as several relatives. This was a public club open to one and all. They did not sell hard liquor, only setups and beer. They had a live combo for dancing. It was a nice place, but filled with people and of undesirable character. Hoods, pawns, pistols, and professional killers. Personal friends of Ruby. Ruby was the key to the actual contracts of the trigger people. He knew many of them and arranged with higher-ups to engage them for their acts. Now, Ruby did not tell me at this particular time, that is, in 1960. However, later in early July 63, I went to Dallas from Amarillo, where we were then living, to try to raise some money to pay off a bad check I had written at a grocery store to feed my children. I ran into Ruby this time, and we went to his office at the carousel. I was still hooked on amphetamine 
shooting as much as 200 milligrams daily. Ruby, incidentally, was still taking Vexedrine. Had asked me for some, but uh, I did not have any with me. Only what I needed for my own use. He did say, however, if I had some he could get, he would pay well for them. I happened to have a total of 16,000 caps of Dexedrine back in Amarillo. But I was so confused and disturbed at the time, I got myself in a jam upon upon my return to Amarillo. So I busted. I lost all my supply. And I went to prison. Though Jack trusted me, he refused to front me enough money to return to Amarillo and bring back the drugs. He trusted no one when it came to money. He said he would give me $2,000 for the pills when I put them in his hand. I agreed to do so. My bust killed that. He said, too, if I wanted in on a really big deal, he would cut me in on it, too, if I was interested. I asked what it was, and he said, the assassination of the president. I said, I wanted no part of that. He said, would not do the actual job, that that part was being handled by others, but I could play a silent role for perhaps five to ten grand. I told him I would think it over, and that if there was no chance of being caught, I just might go along. Remember, I was hooked on speed, man. Had no job, had five children and a wife to feed, dicks to suck, and no money at all to feed him. Later, I did consider his proposal, but spoke to no one of it, as he made it very plain if I did, something just might happen, not only to myself, but to my little family as well. After my bust, I gave up all thought, since I was in no position to protect my family. Could I tell what I knew of plans brewing? While in solitary confinement in the Pine County Jail in Amarillo, I heard of the tragedy. Although I did not know at the time the actual conspirators were our own vice president, the FBI, and CIA. And neither did Ruby until much later. I since discovered this to be true, putting together all clues, revelations, speculations, etc., and especially after hearing some of Jim Garrison's evidence as well as others. I did not know immediately upon the hearing of the president's death that this was part of the plot Ruby spoke to me about, until Ruby played his part by killing Oswald. Then I knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Ruby had a part in it, and had fate not placed me in this cell, I too would have been involved. I thanked God many times after that, that I was where I was when it happened and not out on the streets, for I would probably be dead now, and perhaps my children and wife also. I do recall a strange thing happening to me while in that tiny cell, other than getting raped by Bubba. When I heard Kennedy was playing in a trip to Dallas, uh, a song struck my senses. It went a little something like this. Please, Mr. Kennedy, don't come to Dallas. Don't come to Texas to die. That's all. It was a very, very simple song. Only a couple lines, but I still hear that melody in my head today. The above information is true and correct as I have stated it. Sincerely, Howard Rice Knight of Oakland, California, May the 13th, in the year of our Lord, 1968, folks. Holy nollies. So is this Howard Rice Knight guy legit? Who knows, but he's got a hell of a story. I love it. The bisexual, drug-addicted, uh, Jack Ruby confidant. Hmm. I wonder why Garrison didn't follow up with that. Anyway, moving on. Moving on, folks. From an FBI document dated November the 27th, 1963. 
on the evening of November the 26th, Andrew Armstrong Jr., an employee of the Carousel Club, formerly operated by Jack Ruby. I mean, this is one day after he shot Oswald, uh, but he is never going to operate it again. Formerly operated by Jack Ruby. Made available to Special Agent Robert Lish, a notebook which had been the property of Curtis Laverne Larry Crayford. This notebook is a Penway memo book with a spiral binder. A review of this memo book reflects the following decipherable notations. It is to be noted that portions of the handwriting and printing could not be read. Now, basically, these are uh, just a lot of phone numbers, names, uh, notes. And different things, but you know, a couple couple things did stand out nicely out of this thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, I'm trying to find the page. It's many pages long. Uh, there was a, a note, uh, Bill Rem Remicky. Two couples, good location. Proctor, one couple. Sex, Lacey, with Ravala. What that means. And then Armstrong also made available a letter which he said had been written by Larry Crayford. This letter was on the letterhead stationery of Jack Ruby Associates, Dallas, Texas. In the upper right hand corner was the name C.L. Crayford. 13, 12 and a half commerce. The letter is as follows. Dear Gail, I was pleased to hear from you. I was surprised to hear that you were shocked at what I said, as I thought you could tell it by looking at my face and the way I questioned you and talked to you. I guess that for some stupid reason, I hoped that you might have felt the same way. Stupid of me, I know, but that just goes to show you that you can't trust yourself. Believe me, believe me, you, I tried to stop it from happening, but there's no stopping something like that. You can lie to your mind, but not to your heart. Well, I guess that's enough of this foolishness. Now, to get on to something of importance, first, congratulations and best of luck. I hope you all the happiness in the world. Gail, I've tried really, I've tried really tried to feel like a cousin, but darling, it is very hard to do. Believe me, you. You asked me what I've been doing. Well, as I told you, I'm working here in a club. It's called the Carousel Club, and to tell you the truth, I don't care for it, but it is a living. I would like to see you real soon. I think it would be best all the way around if I don't try. But darling, my heart cries out against this. If I do what I want to do, I'd be back there as quick as I can. But I know that it would do no good. Sincerely, Larry. And he's writing that letter to his cousin, Gail, folks. Okay. Okay. Now, I think it's important we talk about Mr. Larry Crayford here a little bit. It's been a long, long time. Since we talked about him on his show, um, you know, given the revelations from Laura Cottrell that this guy, Crayford, was one of the men she met impersonating Lee Harvey Oswald at the Texas Employment Commission and likely responsible for many of the Ruby Oswald, Oswald sightings in Dallas and some of these crazy Oswald impersonations being done of Oswald in, in the weeks leading up to the assassination, like the the uh, the car dealership and the gun range and furniture store, things like this. It's just it's all crazy. It's all crazy. So the day after the assassination. Uh, Ruby, or I'm sorry, Crayford. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. 
Yes. The day after the assassination, which would have been on the 23rd, Rayford makes a hasty escape from Dallas and heads to Michigan. I'm assuming to go see his sister and cousin that, you know, he loved so much. Uh, so, but anyway, the, the FBI tracks him down. And on November the 29th, 1963, they interview Mr. Crayford uh, very extensively for their report. And this was done at Bel Air, Michigan, the Detroit office of the FBI, by Special Agent Theodore Kramer. Mr. Curtis Laverne Rayford, also known as Curtis Laverne Rayford, spelled correctly, F-O-R-D, something that the uh, Warren Commission did not get right. This is why they couldn't track Mr. Crayford down to the HSCA, because they didn't have his name spelled right. In all these documents, it's spelled C-R-A-F-A-R-D. It was actually C-R-A-F-O-R-D. So, a.k.a. Curtis Laverne Cray Ford, Larry uh, C.L., and uh, Smokey was his nickname, was located at the cabin of Roy Parks in rural Antrim County, Michigan. He was visiting his sister, Mrs. Corbell Ingersoll. This individual volunteered the following information. He said he was born in Farwell, Michigan on March the 10th, 1941. Raised in Michigan and California, until his family moved to Dallas, Oregon in 1958. The family were fruit harvest people. And in September of 58, he enlisted in the United States Army and served until November of 59 when he was given a general discharge under honorable conditions. He married Wilma Jean Heaney, June 16, 62, and she was from Dallas, Texas. He first went to Dallas, Texas in March of 1963 to attempt a reconciliation with his wife. But finally, they separated in June of 1963 as his wife was now a lesbian. Yes, you heard me right, folks. During August of 1963, he started to work with a carnival and followed this work, which accounted for his being at the Texas State Fair in Dallas, Texas, on or about October 15, 1963. He joined a carnival show, which was named How Hollywood Makes Movies, run by Bob Craven of Hollywood, California, and he performed the duties of a roustabout. Come on in! Come on! Come on! Come see how Hollywood makes movies. He lived in a tent on the fairgrounds and stayed with this show and another show, which was a rock and roll outfit, until the fair closed on approximately October the 30th, 63. During the time he was employed with the How Hollywood Makes Movies, he ascertained that Jack Ruby had approximately $150 invested, and on or about October 21st, 63, at closing time, he was introduced to Ruby by Geek Miles, another one of the backers. He saw Ruby two or three times during the Texas State Fair as Ruby would check on the progress of the show. When the fair closed about the end of October, Ruby hired him to tear down the stage and take it to the Carousel Club in Dallas. He worked with a man named Howard. Uh, last name unknown, and a Negro who had been employed by Ruby for approximately 18 years. After completing this job, Ruby asked him to stay at the club and work for room and board. He had the room in front of Ruby's office. This would be approximately November the 1st, 1963. His job at the Carousel Club consisted of being a handyman, cleanup man, part-time bartender, and also answering the telephone. 
It was his duty to take down names and addresses of people calling the club for Ruby. Ruby ran almost an ad every day in the local paper for waitresses and performers. He also had financial interest in a twist board company at Fort Worth, Texas. Telephone calls and a number of 20 to 40 would be received daily, and these calls were placed in a stenographer's notebook, which he kept on Ruby's desk. The only excuse me, odd incident concerning telephone calls was that about three or four times a day during the times he was at the club, a call would come in and the man would ask if Mr. Ruby was there. If Ruby was not there, the man refused to leave his name, and on every occasion during this period of time, it was the same person who called. He brought this to Ruby's attention on numerous occasions, and Ruby told him to forget about it. However, Ruby was not alarmed. Crayford would stay at the club and eat his meals at the Eat Well Cafe and the drugstore across the street. From the club, money for these meals was taken from the cash register. Ruby also purchased his clothes from the Goodwill store for him and gave him some spending money. Ruby had an apartment with an individual named George, last name unknown, who sold Christmas cards and worked part-time from the door at the club. He did not know where Ruby's apartment was located, but had the telephone number WH1-1050. He would see Ruby every day for about one to two hours, and this usually occurred between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. Other than that, Ruby would telephonically contact him almost every hour for any calls. He has no knowledge where Ruby spent his time outside the club. Usually, Ruby would then return to the club at about 10 p.m. each evening and stay until closing time, which was about 1.30 a.m. during weekdays and 2 a.m. on the weekends. He stated Ruby trusted him, and he would handle anywhere from three dollars to $400 a day. However, Andy Armstrong, or Alexander, the assistant manager and bartender, would handle the money until midnight, and thereafter, he would close up. Most of the time, at about 5 p.m., Ruby would call in from his home, and if needed, he told him he would be available there until he came to the club later. He said most of the affairs of the club were handled by Armstrong, who performed paperwork, etc. And this individual was with Ruby for approximately 10 years. Continuing, he said that on a few occasions during the daytime, he would accompany Ruby around the Dallas area. He recalls one day, time unknown, that Ruby went to various companies in regards to the purchase of a safe for the club, as Ruby had the habit of carrying all his money in his pocket. On another occasion, approximately three weeks ago, he went with Ruby. When Ruby checked out some sound equipment for the club, this was at an electronics company in about the 2200 or 2300 block of Elm Street. They were there 10 or 15 minutes and did not purchase anything. And on this occasion, he, Crayford, was wearing a suit. And he feels there were about, that at about 3 or 4 p.m., he said that when they entered the place of business, the electronic equipment speakers, PA systems were on the right and left-hand sides in between a counter and a stairway that went to a storeroom on the second floor. He related that um, most of Ruby's time at the club was spent talking business, and he had the habit of always telling the employees who they could talk to. Ruby was somewhat outspoken, had a quick temper, and when mad, would use loud language in his relations with the employees. On November 17, 63, he recalls telling Ruby that he would desire to cease his employment there on the 18th. He said that Ruby told him uh, he would put him on a salary and persuaded him to stay indefinitely. Rayford said he was not too fond of the work and was not busy enough at the club. He also said Ruby had a 38 caliber revolver, which he kept in a money sack located in the trunk of his car. He said that when transporting money, Ruby kept his money in the trunk with the revolver and always kept the revolver with him when moving money. In regards to Ruby's temper, he said that one night, approximately November 14th or 15th, Ruby was having trouble with an MC, Earl Norman, at the carousel at about 1.30 a.m. He, Ruby, sent Crayford out to the car to get the gun. That was the only time he ever handled Ruby's gun, and on that occasion, did not take it out of the sack. He said that the gun was believed to be the property of Howard, the Negro employee. On November 20th, 
63, he recalls Ruby coming in at 4 or 5 in the afternoon and requesting Crayford to go work at the Club Vegas. Ruby stayed at the carousel until 6.30 p.m., and Andy, the bartender, was there, along with George, Ruby's roommate. At the latter time, Ruby returned to his home and came back to the club at about 8 p.m. when he transported Crayford to the Club Vegas. That evening, he called three or four times in regards to the crowd and Mrs. Eva Grant. Ruby's sister also called in regards to the crowd. Closing time, which was 2 a.m., Ruby called and said he would be late as the law was at the place and little Lynn, one of the strippers, was sick and he had to take care of her. He waited there until approximately the quarter to four in the morning, at which time Ruby met him and they had breakfast at the Lucas B&B restaurant next door to the club. On this date, Ruby was accompanied by a girl named Gloria who did not work at the club and who was about 22, white female, 5'6", 125, blonde hair. This girl would be known to Margie, a waitress at the carousel. He said that Ruby returned him to the carousel at approximately 4.30 a.m. on November the 21st, 1963. So this is where we get the Mary Lawrence sighting at the B&B, Lucas B&B restaurant of Oswald and Ruby. It was actually... Larry Crayford. Also not mentioned by Mary Lawrence was that Ruby was with a sweet young blonde dime piece named Gloria who did not work at the club. On November the 21st, 63, Ruby called the club to wake him up at about 11 a.m. and then came in later in the afternoon sometime between 12 and 3. Andy was at the club at this time, and he recalled there was a woman, along with her husband, who desired a job. Thereafter, Ruby left and later in the afternoon called him again to go to the Vegas as the bartender. At 7.30 p.m., Ruby picked him up and took him to the Vegas club, and he did not see Ruby again until approximately 2.30 a.m. after closing, at which time they again had breakfast at the Lucas B&B, returning to the carousel at about 3.30 or 4 a.m. Okay. Well, maybe this is why Mary Lawrence didn't mention the sweet little blonde dime piece that was with Ruby because Gloria was not with them the next night before the assassination at 4 a.m. at the Lucas B&B. But they apparently went there two nights in a row. Hmm. On November the 22nd, 63, he said he was awakened by Andy Armstrong, the bartender, at 11.30 a.m. by way of telephone. He then dropped back to sleep, and shortly after noon, Andy came to the club, personally woke him up, and stated that the president had been shot. He had not heard from Ruby previously that date, and at about 1.30 p.m., Ruby came into the club and said the club would be closed that night and the entire weekend. He told Andy to notify the personnel, and thereafter called the paper and placed an ad to that effect. Crayford said that he was much surprised by this action as the club could not financially stand to be closed, and it was strictly his opinion that Ruby did this as a gesture to make goodwill on behalf of the public. After being, or he said it seemed odd to him that Ruby was more excited about the Earl Warren sign than about the assassination. Uh, Ruby at this time made no threats or other comments concerning Oswald. That's being dropped off at the club. Rayford called Ruby at 8 a.m., at Ruby's apartment and told Ruby that they needed food for the three Dachshunds that were kept at the club. Crayford said that Ruby berated him for waking him up, and he then decided to pack up and leave the club as he did not want to take any other verbal abuse. He did not say anything to anyone about leaving and just packed his clothes, left the club at about noon that date, and started hitchhiking north. He proceeded north on 77 to Oklahoma City, and on to Clare, Michigan, where he arrived on Monday the 25th at about 9.30 p.m. at the home of a cousin, Clifford Roberts. His main reason for coming north was to reconnect, uh, recontact his sister, who had not written him for some time. He had no other explanation for his hasty departure, but said it was just the way he does things. <laughs> yeah, just the way he does things. Okay. So there's a little bit about Larry Crayford and Jack Ruby. You know, we uh, 
we forget a little bit about Mr. Crayford and what he says. So, and they took his description. They took a couple of pictures of Larry Crayford at this time. Crayford explained that his surname is Crayford rather than Crayford, as is the rest of the family. Because when he entered the army, his name was misspelled as Crayford, and he has considered this his name ever since. Huh. Interesting. But damn, if he didn't change it back to Crayford after the assassination, folks. Which is why they couldn't find Larry Crayford. Uh, in closing, Crayford said that he intended to stay in, in the Bel Air, Michigan area until Friday, December 6th. And his address will always be known to Miss Gail Eaton of Harrison, Michigan, his beautiful cousin. And he will advise the Traverse City Resident Agency of the Federal Bureau of Investigation by card of any moves. Several colored photographs were taken of Crayford, and the following physical description was obtained from interview and observation. Name, Curtis Laverne Crayford, aliases, Curtis Laverne Crawford, Larry C.O. Smokey, race white, male, age 22, born March 10, 41, Farwell, Michigan, height, 5'8", 150, brown hair, brown eyes, yada, yada, yada. So, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And then we have a looks like to be an FBI document, maybe. From the HSCA. Quote, the killer of the assassin of the deceased President Kennedy, Jack Rubenstein, has been proven the owner of a tourist office in the Sevilla Hotel in Havana, Cuba. Okay. Lanusa stated there was no evidence to support this statement. However, he regarded the allegation as true since it appeared in, in the clandestine news sheet disseminated by an anti-Castro organization known as AR. Excuse me, AC. Lanusa said that in addition to the information from Iraq, Juan Manuel Salvat, another officer in the DRE in Miami, had received a letter containing additional information pertaining to Ruby and Pratkins. This letter had been sent from Cuba to an exiled Cuban attorney, formerly known as Valdez Folly who furnished it to Salvat, according to Lanusa. Lanusa said this letter reported that Jack Rubenstein was a habitual visitor to a souvenir store located across the street from the Sevilla Hotel on Prado Street in Havana, Cuba. The store belonged to a man by the name of Pratkins. Rubenstein reportedly visited the store about a year ago, that is, about January 63, after flying to Cuba by way of Mexico City. Lanusa stated that in the first part of January 54, on the occasion of the visit by, by him to the office of Mr. Frank Watterson of the State Department in Miami, Florida, he mentioned to Mr. Watterson the information that Jack Ruby had gone to Cuba during 63 and had been associated with the individual Prakins in a tourist business at the Zaville Hotel in Havana. Hua. Hua. I don't know about that, but we've all heard the allegations about Jack Ruby being a gun runner to Cuba in the 50s, right? And we've all had heard that rumor. Um, but where does this come from? What information do we have to back this up? Or is it just some kind of vague accusation? Well, apparently during the time of the HSCA, Somebody was very busy collecting information about Jack Ruby's gun running activities in the 50s to Castro. 
Okay. So here we're going to have uh, some reports from some different people about Zap Ruby's gun running activities in the 50s. Starting with this one. Um, so Meyer Lansky and Santos Traficante were out of Hogan's reach in Cuba and were prospering enormously. The only problem stemmed from the fact that Cuba was a, quote, banana republic. This meant constant, periodic changes of government. In order to hedge his bets and protect himself against an unexpected coup d'etat, Lansky began supporting Carlos Prio's, quote, government in exile. Prio, in turn, supported a young rebel named Fidel Castro. Castro and his 26th of July movement had begun guerrilla warfare against Batista and had allegedly agreed to reinstall Prio as president if they defeated Batista. In 1957, Jack Ruby began shipping arms to Fidel Castro. This information came to light in 1976 when James Beard came forward and told the FBI that in 1957, he became acquainted with many people in the area of Kima, Texas, including one Jack Ruby, who was at that time, quote, involved in the business of selling guns to Fidel Castro in Cuba. Jack stored guns and ammunition in a two-story house between the waterfront and railroad tracks in Kima, Texas. He would take the guns to Cuba, mostly on the weekends. Jack had a boat about 50 feet long, surplus, a military landing craft, or LST. By 77, the author of this book called Mr. Beard and asked him how he became acquainted with Jack Ruby. His answer, playing poker. What I can't understand, this seems a little out of line. Well, there was enough people like myself who knew all about this. The doggone thing is that he was so open with it. Why nobody came forward with this information beats me. Ruby never talked about Castro. The boat would get loaded and Ruby would leave by car. It is a well-known fact that the boat was headed to Cuba. In June of 1958, Jack Ruby was selling arms in Isla Morada, Florida. Mary Lou Woodard, who was introduced to Jack Ruby by her husband, James Woodard, who was an adventurer and soldier of fortune, blew the whistle on him after the Kennedy assassination. According to Mary Lou, Jack had a trunk full of guns and said he was going to supply them to the Cubans. He was driving a great car with Texas plates. I was told he was originally from Chicago and a part of the syndicate. The FBI never interviewed Woodard on January 23, 64. An order went out to discontinue active investigation to locate Woodard. Instead, the FBI transmitted the results of a September 63 interview to the Warren Commission. During the interview, Woodard alleged he had participated in the Bay of Pigs invasion and had furnished ammunition and dynamite to both Castro and anti-Castro forces. A month later, the FBI re-interviewed Woodard about stolen dynamite, which had been stored at his residence in South Dade County. Woodard told them the explosives were going to be used against the Castro regime. The most important witness to Ruby's smuggling activities was Mac Blaney Johnson, the same informant who supplied the FBI with the Ruby Colonial Inn Link. Johnson told the FBI that in the 1950s he was an independent airplane pilot engaged in numerous flights of cargo from Miami to Havana. This is how I learned about illegal flights of weapons from Miami to the Castro organization in Cuba. Jack Ruby was active in arranging these flights. He used the name Jack Rubenstein in this connection. He was part owner of two airplanes used for smuggling arms. Donald Edward Browder was associated with Ruby in this operation. Ruby contracted Joe Mars to make flights to Havana. The former police chief of Hialeah, Florida, Leslie Lewis, knows about Ruby's flights. The FBI questioned Lewis. He told them he never heard of Jack Ruby and had no knowledge whatsoever of person flying weapons to Cuba. Joe Mars told the FBI the same story, although he admitted knowing Browder. On November the 30th, 1963, Johnson was recontacted by the FBI and shown a photograph of Jack Ruby. Johnson said he was convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the Jack Rubenstein that he knew 
was identical to Jack Ruby. He had, he added that Clifton Bowes Jr., a national airline pilot, was familiar with Rubenstein as well. When the FBI questioned Bowes, he told them the same story as Lewis and Mars. Johnson told the FBI that these men were lying due to their participation in illegal activities. Nevertheless, the FBI determined investigation appears to indicate information furnished by Johnson is a fabrication in its entirety. No further inquiries in same connection are intended. Unquote. The FBI began pressuring Johnson to recant his story. They interviewed his wife and tried to confuse him with extraneous photographs. Then the Miami office of the FBI ordered Atlanta to advise Johnson that his identity can no longer be held in confidence. Despite this, Johnson reaffirmed the truthfulness and accuracy of information heretofore furnished and expressed belief that Lewis, Mars, and Bose have to serve their own interests, lied concerning their knowledge of or participation in weapon smuggling together with Jack Rubenstein's involvement. Eventually, the FBI had located Donald Edward Browder, and he turned out to be Edward J. Browder, and interviewed him. Browder denied knowing Ruby, etc., and the FBI officially closed the investigation into Mac Blaney Johnson's charges. The FBI agent who handled Johnson resigned in protest over the way his information was suppressed. A glance at Browder's rap sheet could have told the FBI that Johnson was not lying. Browder had been involved in arms smuggling to Cuba. A closer study of Browder's life would have revealed the fact that Browder had associations with land, or with the lead, sorry, to, directly to Jack Ruby. Uh, Browder was born in 1917 in Amarillo, Texas. Browder's father was Secretary Treasurer of the Santa Fe Railroad. In 1942, at age 25, Browder enlisted in the Army. In 1944, he became a volunteer pilot for the Royal Air Force. In 1947, Browder took the first step on a road that would lead him to a virtual life sentence in federal prison. He stole a cache of machine guns from an army base located in Augusta, Georgia. A few days later, a federal warrant was signed charging Browder with theft of government property and ordered his arrest. When Browder was taken into custody, he told the authorities that he'd become involved in a conspiracy to overthrow President Romulo Betancourt of Venezuela. A few weeks later, a federal grand jury in Tulsa, Oklahoma, indicated, or I'm sorry, indicted him for unlawfully exporting a P-38 airplane from Tulsa to Havana. Before Browder came to trial on these charges, he was hit with another charge, conspiracy to smuggle arms from Florida to Cuba. Arms which were eventually destined for a revolution in the Dominican Republic. A Cuban government official was named as the instigator of the plot. The judges in Miami and Tulsa gave Browder probation, but the judge in Georgia gave him 18 months. Browder served his time and was released from federal prison in September of 49. He returned to Miami, then began to travel around America, getting arrested pretty much wherever he went. He returned to Miami in 57 and began working with the 26th of July movement. Browder would buy arms from a CIA proprietary, the International Arms Corporation, Interarmco, then smuggle them to Castro and his men in the Sierra Madres. Browder dealt with Ephraim Pardo, the local rep of the 26th of July movement. In 1954, Ricardo had pleaded innocent of conspiracy to ship arms to Cuba on behalf of the former president, Carlos Prio Sataras. His co-defendants in this case included Marcos diaz Lands, a close associate of Watergate burglar Frank Sturgis. The FBI questioned Sturgis about the whereabouts of Ricardo in the course of their investigation of Browder. In 1978, Sturgis was asked by this author if he knew Browder. He answered he was, quote, not sure. In 59, Browder was arrested for possession of $136,000 worth of stolen securities. Browder claimed that the bonds, which were stolen from two Canadian banks, did not come from the National Crime Syndicate. According to Browder, the 26th July movement had given him the stolen securities. The available evidence contradicted this, and Browder had told Jesse Vickers, who had been arrested with Picardo in 1953, that Cleveland mob people were connected with the securities. Browder's passport revealed he had recently returned from Switzerland, 
where the mob laundered millions of dollars and his wallet contained the name of an attorney who defended numerous mob figures. Another of Browder's associates, Paul Hickman, told the FBI that Vito Genovese, a nationally known hoodlum, had advised Browder to shut up about the origin of the bonds. During Browder's trial, he was asked if he knew National Crime Syndicate member Sam Manorino. Browder answered, I was introduced to him by one of Carlos Prio's followers on the assumption that Mr. Manorino was going to supply some money for arms for some of the Cubans involved in fighting against Batista. I understood that this money came from people that uh, had gambling associations in Cuba uh, or slot machines in Cuba that he was trying to protect in the event that Castro overthrew Batista. Okay. Manorino's partner, Norman, Normie Roughhouse Rothman, was born on December 26, 1914, in the Bronx, New York. In 51, Rothman became another victim of the Kefauver investigation and was arrested several times on gambling violations. In 52, he moved to Cuba and began managing the San Suchi Casino along with Trafico, Santo Traficante Jr. In 1956, Rothman was charged with the interstate transportation and gambling devices when the FBI intercepted a shipment of his slot machines on their way to Cuba. Rothman had become the slot machine king of Havana and was busily dividing up the rest of Cuba among fellow gam gangsters like Sam Manorino and Santo Traficante. Rothman had become the slot king by going into partnership with Batista's brother-in-law. By 56, Rothman had a controlling interest in another casino called the Tropicana. So... Rothman, Manorino, and another fellow named Controni were all National Crime Syndicate members involved in gun smuggling to Cuba. They were closely associated with Edward Browder, who was linked to Jack Ruby, not only through Johnson's testimony, but through his co-defendant on the Canadian stolen securities case, Frank Francesco Ferrara. Ferrara, who was indicted in his native city of New Haven, Connecticut, on two counts of dealing in stolen securities, was arrested a month after Browder and promptly jumped bail. Ferrara, who admitted that he was a close associate of Browder, probably was the same Frank R. Ferrara who became an employee of Jack Ruby in 1962. During the course of the Hunt v. Weberman libel suit in Miami, Frank Sturgis was asked if he knew Rothman, I've never worked for Norman Rothman. I knew him in Cuba. When I returned to the States, I ran across him on the beach with my Cuban friends. Just hello, goodbye, have a drink, and then leave. That's it. Investigative reporter Earl Goles discovered that a Frank Ferraro of Whittier, California, allegedly met Tony Accardo of Chicago when he visited Los Angeles in 1953. So, uh, da, 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 da. Then we hear about this dude, Dominique Bartone, who was an old-time Cleveland gangster who dated back to the time of Al Capone. When Castro came to power in early 59, Bartone attempted to win his favor by smuggling him several plane loads of arms. Bartone had worked out a deal with Jimmy Hoffa. The Teamsters Union would lend a, quote, Cleveland Group $300,000 to buy several surplus cargo and aircraft. Bartone would supply the arms, and the pilot would fly the plane to Cuba. Bartone was promptly indicted for his efforts. In late 59, Bartone and Edward Browder formed the Aero Ordnance Corporation, which had allegedly dealt in, quote, government surplus. When the FBI questioned Bartone about Browder's whereabouts, he told him he did not know where Browder was and had disassociated himself from him. In 62, Browder turned himself in, and began serving his sentence. Mac Blaney Johnson's information opened up a can of worms into, or that neither the FBI nor the Warren Commission wanted to get into. Mac was written off as a crank, despite the fact that his contentions were partially corroborated by State Department documents. These documents, uh, Browden is currently serving a 25-year sentence for a 1970 stolen securities rap, revealed that in 1958, Jack Rubenstein, wrote a letter requesting permission to negotiate the purchase of firearms and ammunition from an Italian firm. Interestingly enough, in January of 1959, Eddie Browder traveled to Italy 
to negotiate the purchase of 5,000 submachine guns. Jack Rubenstein is also mentioned in a 1959 Department of the Army report concerning U.S. arms dealers in Scandinavia. A Jack Rubenstein is listed as a representative of the Saunders Company in the U.S. In 1976, this author attempted to obtain copies of the Office of Munitions Control and Army Intelligence Reports under the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. The Army conducted a thorough search of their files and even went as far as checking all reports in their possession on Jack Ruby and Jack Rubenstein. No report dealing with arms trafficking was uncovered. The State Department responded that while the existence of the letter may have been known in 63, we are now unable to locate it. They suggested that the letter might be in the inactive files at the Office of Munitions Control, but demanded a $2,000 fee for a, quote, search involving 15,000 documents. There is reason to believe the CIA was aware of Jack Rubenstein and his activities, In their letter to the Warren Commission regarding information concerning Jack Ruby, the CIA stated examination of CIA records failed to produce information on Jack Ruby or his activities. What about Rubenstein? The CIA is currently withholding a brief biography of an individual named Jack Rubenstein whose name is the same as Jack Ruby's, but his background obviously shows that he is a separate individual in no way related to Jack Ruby who killed Lee Harvey Oswald. The question remains obvious to whom. Not only was the CIA aware of Ruby's Jack Rubenstein identity, they also had information that Ruby used the alias of Abe Rubenstein. In 1958, a former member of the Oklahoma State Crime Bureau linked an Abe Rubenstein, owner of the Carousel Club in Dallas, to a carload of guns and ammunition destined for Cuba. Thanks in parts to the efforts of the National Crime Syndicate, Castro was soon able to outgun Batista. In 1958, three months before Castro took power in Cuba, Jack sent Louis McWillie to Havana. McWillie would work under Normie Roughhouse Rothman as a pit boss in the Tropicana Casino. Actually, he had come to Havana as a troubleshooter for the mob. The mob was convinced Batista was doomed and needed men like McWillie whose abilities, or I'm sorry, whose allies in the mob and supply had supplied Castro with arms to smooth over the inevitable transition and protect the syndicate's interest. Um, so yeah, there's just a little bit about uh, Jack Ruby and his uh, gun running stuff. And, well, I wouldn't be complete without his last one here. So let's see. Da, 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 da. Santos, who was widely believed to be involved in narcotics traffic, was arrested by Castro's bearded ones, as was Jake Lansky, Meyer Lansky's brother. A week later, January 7, 1959, the Lansky brothers caught a chartered plane to Florida. Many other hoodlums, such as Normie Rothman and Charlie the Blade Horing, were not arrested and remained in Cuba, hoping to win favorable concessions from Fidel since they had helped put him in power. Lansky and Marcello were deeply disturbed by Santos' imprisonment and began taking steps to free the Mafia Don. The syndicate wanted anyone who pulled weight with Fidel to intervene on Santos' behalf. Jack Ruby knew of one person, and in January of 1959, he sent a message to a man named Robert Ray McCown, Castro's personal gunrunner. McCown had a long history on involvement with Cuban affairs. In 1950, he ran a coffee processing plant in Santiago, Cuba, with the blessing of Cuban President Carlos Prio. When Prio was overthrown by Batista in 52, McCown began to work to restore him to power. In late 52, McCown was the subject of an FBI Neutrality Act investigation in connection with air arms smuggling to Prio's forces within Cuba. In 1956, McCown was living in Miami, having been deported by Batista. In Miami, McCown was involved in gun-running ventures aimed at overthrowing the Batista regime. The FBI learned that the Castro's 26th of July movement was planning a raid on Cuba from Texas. In connection with this raid, arms had been shipped to McCown. In 1957, McCown was back in his native Texas and was allegedly employed by Ruby. McCown would pilot Jack's armed-laden ships from Kima or Seabrook to a drop-off point in Mexico. 
Del Castro himself would land his boat, the Grandma, and pick up the arms. Jake was released in a matter of hours, only to be rearrested. On February 18, 1958, the San Antonio FBI office provided information that McCown had purchased a yacht. U.S. Customs seized this vessel for smuggling guns while it was cruising to Houston from Patterson, Louisiana. On February 25th, 58, McCown was charged with conspiracy to smuggle guns and related equipment to Castro forces in Cuba. An agent of the ATF Division of the Treasury Department raided McCown's home and discovered a small arsenal. The ATF agent did not locate Ruby's warehouse, though. And eight months later, McCown was given a 60-day sentence and five years probation. Shortly after this arrest and prior to his sentencing, McCown and a Mr. Jarrett formed a partnership and opened the J&M Drive-In on Red Bluff Road in the vicinity of Kima, Texas. Rio funded this venture with a loan. When Ruby contacted McCown in January 59, he asked him to use his influence with Castro to, quote, Get three individuals out of Cuba, which are being held by Fidel Castro. Ruby offered McCown at least $15,000 for his efforts and told him the syndicate would be eternally grateful to him. One week later, Ruby and McCown had a meeting near Kima, at which time McCown allegedly gave his old associate a letter of introduction to Castro. McCown did not come forward and give this information to the FBI after Ruby shot Oswald. After Ruby spoke of an individual, quote, in the vicinity of Houston who had run guns to Castro, the FBI contacted McCown. McCown concocted a story for the FBI that would protect his former relationship with Ruby. Through the years, the details of the story have changed so frequently that McCown almost earned a perjury citation from the HSCA. On January the 28th, 1964, McCown told the FBI that about a week after Castro came into power, Anthony Bootsayo, a patrolman from Harris County in Houston, informed him that someone from Dallas had called the sheriff's office looking for him. McCown told Ayo to give the caller the phone number of the J&M drive-in. In this, the first part of McCown's story, he is attempting to show that he had no previous connections with Ruby whatsoever, since Ruby had to get his number from the sheriff's office. Hmm. Why A.O. had to speak with McCown in person rather than calling him at the J&M drive-in is itself suspicious, and when questioned by the FBI, A.O. confirmed McCown's story. McCown went on to say an hour later, a Jack Rubenstein from Dallas called and offered him $15,000 to help release three prisoners from Castro jails. Rubenstein stated that someone in Las Vegas would provide the money. Three weeks later, Jack showed up at the J&M in person up the ante to $25,000 and stated he had access to a large number of Jeeps in Shreveport, Louisiana. When McCown demanded five grand up front, Ruby left, never to return again. It is interesting to note that McCown said Ruby used the name Rubenstein. McCown would have us believe the deal was never consummated, when in all likelihood it was. When interviewed by HSCA investigator Gaten Fonzie in 76, McCown added that Ruby thought McCown's name was Davis and that Ruby told him that aside from Jeeps, he had access to some slot machines in New Mexico. Ruby mentioned that he knew some members of the mafia in Cuba and spoke with McCown on three occasions. McCown's mention of Davis to Mr. Fonzie in 76 is significant because in 1964, Ruby told the FBI he had contacted an individual when the FBI asked McCown about Davis in 64, he told him he knew no one by that name in Houston, Texas. Dallas Assistant District Attorney William Alexander reported he had learned Ruby had contact with a Davis, described as an ex-convict from Beaumont. The Houston FBI reported they failed to locate an ex-convict named Davis, despite the fact that in June of 58, Davis attempted to rob a bank in Detroit for which he had served five years probation. In September of 60, Davis's probation supervision had been transferred to the Federal Probation Office in Beaumont, Texas. His probation was terminated on February 21, 1962. The FBI could have produced traces on Davis if they so desired, only to do so would endanger a sensitive CIA operation. Seth Cantor, in his book Who Was Jack Ruby, contends that Davis was linked to CIA assassin Q.J. Wynn, 
and unsavory a character with a network of mafia contacts. QJ Wynn was the CIA's top assassin in Europe and Africa, according to the 75 Senate Select Committee on Intelligence final report. According to Cantor, Ruby allegedly told his first lawyer, Tom Howard, that he had intended to begin a regular gun running business with Davis. The HSCA, intent on covering up any CIA connection to Ruby, did not study the Davis angle in depth. They concluded, due to limitations of time and resources, it is not possible to confirm Cantor's allegations. QJ Wynn's CIA file was reviewed, but revealed nothing about a Davis. The committee made no effort to interview QJ Wynn, which, of course, now we all know was Jose Marie Andre Mankell and not Davis. However, the committee did discover an FBI report dated June 25, 63, which linked D Davis to possible CIA operations. And in May of 63, Davis placed an ad offering employment to soldiers of fortune who wished to go to Haiti to overthrow Papa Doc Duvalier. The FBI, through liaison, asked the CIA if this was one of their operations. The CIA pro forma, of course, denied that it was. Davis had a large backlog of experience as a mercenary. His wife told a State Department official that he was a, quote, soldier of fortune who had worked in Indo Indochina, Indonesia, Algeria, and Cuba. In early 63, Davis and his wife left the United States for Tangiers, Morocco. In December of 63, the Moroccan National Security Police through Interpol informed the State Department that Davis was being held on the basis of an attempted sale of a firearm to a minor. When the Moroccan police searched Davis, they found a letter in his handwriting which referred in passing to Oswald and to the Kennedy assassination. The letter was addressed to an attorney named Thomas Proctor. Davis was killed in September of 73 while stealing copper wire from an abandoned rock crusher site in Wise County, Texas. He was, quote, accidentally electrocuted. McCown's Motivation in bringing up Davis's name was probably to take some of the heat off of himself. When he testified before the HSCA, McCown took the fifth until he was granted immunity. McCown stuck to the embellished version of his story, which included a claim that he was also visited by Oswald and a mysterious pro Castro Cuban named Hernandez. They wanted 300 submachine guns, despite McCown's flimsy attempt to link Castro to the Kennedy assassination. Some of his HSCA testimony bears repeating. Ruby says, I will give you $25,000 if you write me this letter where you will acknowledge that I'm a friend of yours and have done business with you and things. Uh, the HSCA was unable to locate Proctor. Uh, he asked me all about where I had been with Castro and how we had talked, and he kept after me about how many arms were there and were there two million worth? Then he came back and we would talk about uh, what warehouse I put the guns in and who all helped me haul them out to his house. He came back and I told him I had the letter written. I had all this written down, but somebody burned down my house and I lost it. He said he knew the mafia. He said he had connections. He said, you don't have to worry about money. I have good connections. He asked me if I was familiar with the Ponce Club in Miami where all the Latina congregated. McCown was quizzed about his various associates. How did you hear of Sam or Joseph Campisi? Who we started the show off with, Mr. The Owner of the Egyptian Restaurant. Mr. McCown says, through Prio, he said they were good people. They were on our side. I assumed he was working with his. I don't know. Did you know Joe Marola? McCown says, yes, he would come to me and tell me where guns would be. Ernie, have you had any connections which you later found out had been with the CIA? McCown says, yes, I later found out, but I did not know. I met him at a club. I did not know him from Adam, and he commenced telling me about Castro. He was over there in the mountains with Castro, and he said that Castro had it in for him and that he did not want to go to Cuba. What contact did you have with Castro after he took power? McCown says, well, some friends of my brother were fishing and the Cubans confiscated their boat and brought them to Cuba. My brother came to me and told me these three guys were really good friends of his and that they were innocent. 
so they asked me if I could help get them out of Cuba. This was quite a while after he was in power, maybe 65. Four or five of the so-called uh, mafia under Batista that ran the casinos came to me and wanted me to try and help get help them get back over there. They wanted me to go and try to get them to the open the Americana again and the San Susi and all that. This was a couple of months after he took power. One of them was Italian. They had all been forced to leave Cuba. Santos Traficante, one of these individuals. No, says McCown. Do you know Carlos Marcello? No, says McCown. Do you know Frank Sturgis? I have seen him one time at Prio's house, but I did not have any dealings with him whatsoever. Purdy says, do you remember any of the names of the mafioso who approached you? McCown says, it seemed to me that one of them was named Matthews, R.D. Matthews, but I'm not sure connected with the Tropicana. I'd say he was connected. McCown was probably referring to R.D. Matthews. Matthews had been in Havana, Cuba from July 58 till January 59. Matthews told the HSCA that when he moved to Cuba in 58, he purchased the Sportsman's Club, which was located in the lobby of the Plaza Hotel, and he resided at the Hotel Deauville. In interviews with the FBI, he stated he worked in the gambling casino of the Deauville. A 1959 FBI report states Matthews' move to Cuba was made on behalf of Santos Traficante, And a 62 FBI report confirms this. An FBI informant overheard a conversation between Matthews and Paxton, during which both men admitted having worked for Santos Traficante. The Embers Club in Havana and the San Susi were also mentioned. The informant stated it was apparent that Matthews was in the Dallas Rackets and he had worked for a big-time gambling house in Havana. In his HSCA deposition, Matthews denied knowing Santos and also stated he had no association with the San Susi, a casino operated by Traficante in Havana. So, you can see the connections here. They're all over the place. Between the syndicate, the uh, the CIA, the FBI, and these gun-running operations to Cuba, and all of this supposedly clandestine kind of stuff going on. Uh, you know, the funny business with McCown and Ruby. It's just insane. It gets crazier and crazier. But this is where the accusations come from. It's hard to, de- to deny you know, when you have all these connections that were never looked into or overlooked or purposely uh, not followed up on. I mean, to me, you know, if Jack Ruby was in the gun running business, and you know, he owned a boat, was coordinating flights, doing all this stuff for the syndicate, hearing arms, Trafficking arms, um, you know, he was in unto his eyeballs. And like I've always said, you know, I don't care how crazy you are, what you've done in your life. Um, you know, at that point in your life, you've got good businesses going on. You know, you're you're making things happen. You're you've got money. Um, just to throw that all away and decide that you're going to murder another man in front of a lot of people and TV cameras, one of the most notorious men in the history of the United States, and you're going to take them out. But you hope they stop you before you can pull the trigger. All you had to do was either put blanks in that gun or put no bullets in that gun and just made it look like they got to you or even in hell if you even if you had live ammo in there you know if if you would have jumped out a little 
sooner in front of Oswald where the police officers had time to react or somebody had time to react and take you down and get that gun away from you. Um, at least it would have looked like you tried to do something. But no, you jumped out at just the right time. You pointed that gun in just the right place to do the maximum organ damage to Mr. Oswald. And it landed you in prison. And for a man to take another man's life that did not do anything directly to him is a big ask. Okay. And I know there's crazy people in the world, but you have to remember this guy was a very meticulous business owner. Crazy people are not capable of running businesses, uh, you know, keeping all the entertainment straight, um, you know, keeping uh, keeping up appearances over town, uh, entertaining, talking to people on the phone, checking in all day, taking care of animals, uh, you know, crazy people don't do that. Okay. Ruby was a lot of things, but he was not crazy in the psychiatric sense of the word. He was a man motivated to do what he did. Okay. By likely underworld figures who threatened either his life, his dog's life, or his family's life. And Jack Ruby had to do what he had to do. And he waited until the absolute last freaking minute that he could have done it to do it. But that's it, folks. For this, the last episode of the Lone Gummit Podcast of 2022 not not forever once again thanks to randy appreciate it appreciate the music and folks happy new year and your boy will see you next year big bad bob ow
Big bad above with you. Big bad above with you. <laughs>